Uh, so tonight, I'm pleased to welcome William Powers. He joins us to speak on his book, 12 by 12, A, a One-Room Cabin Off the Grid and Beyond the American Dream. In a society where many of us are simultaneously listening to an iPod, talking on a cell phone, drinking a latte, and driving, it can be difficult to find a moment to breathe, let alone try to find deeper meaning in our everyday lives. In his new memoir, 12 by 12, William Powers thrusts himself into a new way of living and, in turn, a new way of thinking. Publishers Weekly asserts that Powers sobering and often hilarious, taking showers in rainwater warm by the sun, learning that in order to eat chicken for dinner, he himself would have to kill a chicken given to him by his neighbors. Narrative of his life in the 12 by 12 offers precious insights into the way, the ways that all individuals living in a fast paced consumer culture might incorporate different ways of, of thinking about the natural world into their lives. A renowned environmental activist and author Bill McKibben says that 12 by 12 is a penetrating account of what it's like to move to the margins in our particular time and place. It will make you think hard. William Powers is the author of Blue, Blue Clay People, Seasons on Africa's Fragile Edge, and Whispering in the Giant's Ear, a frontline chronicle from Bolivia's war on globalization. For over a decade, Powers has led development aid and conservation initiatives in Latin America, Africa, and Washington, D.C. His essays on global issues have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Slate, The Sun, and the International Herald Tribune. He's appeared on various media outlets, including NPR's Living on Earth and Fresh Air. We are thrilled to have him with us this evening, so will you please join me in welcoming William Powers. So I wanted to you know, tell you a little bit about the book and read from it and then have some chance for discussion uh, this evening. And I hope we have a wonderful hour together. Um, there's a lot to talk about. This is the release of this new book that just came out. I've been touring around the country. I'm just getting, getting back from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Phoenix, and Tucson, DC, and New York. And I'm on my way up to Vermont and then North Carolina. So it's a whirlwind uh, tour right now. And the book itself you know, actually has two, two layers. On the one level, it's a memoir of my experience living in this 12 foot by 12 foot house in North Carolina and of the experience I had with other wild crafters living on the creative edge um, off grid and living very sustainable lifestyles. But on the other hand, I think it was Kafka who said that a book should be an ax to a frozen soul. And really what the book is about is that upper level of trying to really just get into our consciousness as readers as literature tries to do and change things. So I introduced concepts like um, the creative edge wild crafters and the soft world, which is a reaction to Thomas Friedman's terrible metaphor, excuse me, of a flat world. Um, so we're trying to change uh, the world by changing the story, in a sense. And so it's a bigger picture uh, type of a, of a work. Um, so with that said, I would just like to just jump right in. I know a doctor who makes $11,000 a year, my mother said. I looked up suddenly curious. She's an acquaintance of mine, my mother continued, passing me a basket of bread across the dinner table. Lives an hour from here in a 12 foot by 12 foot house with no electricity. I'd come down to visit my parents in North Carolina from New York City, where I'd recently landed after several years in Bolivia. My mother went on, as a senior physician, she could make $300,000, but she accepts only 11 and gives the rest back. So this Dr. Jackie Benton, she lives in a 12 by 12 house. That's physically impossible. That bookcase is 12 by 12. <laughs> she doesn't have running water either. She harvests the rainwater from her roof. I stopped eating and looked out the window. The rust colored sky above my parents' condo hovered exquisitely between orange and red. That distinctive sky momentarily brought me back to Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, beneath a similar red-orange glow, and the echo of a question a shaman had asked me, what's the shape of the world? Something moved inside me. I looked over at my mom and asked, do you have any way of contacting Dr. Benton? I have her mobile number, my mom said, says. She keeps it off, but does check messages every now and then. So that's how the adventure began. Uh, and believe it or not, I actually got through to her. It took a while. She's not very uh, easy to contact. And um, here's a little snippet from going out to her permaculture farm for the first time. Jackie squatted behind two heirloom tea bushes covered with golden honeybees. 
They explored her skin, her hair, the folds of her white cotton pants and blouse. I could see her stroking the wings of one of them. She was so absorbed in it that she didn't even hear me pull up. She led me through her permaculture farm. She pointedly described permaculture as the things your grandparents knew and your parents forgot, adding that the word is a conjunction of both permanent agriculture and permanent culture. We made it to the core of her farm, zone one, stepping inside a green plastic deer fence. It circled a half acre of her two acres and harbored dozens of gardens full of vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Then something stopped me. Was it a house? The edifice was so slight that, viewed from a certain angle, it seemed as if it might simply vanish, like looking down the sharp edge of a razor blade. Wait a minute. Sure, I'd seen the structure several times already during our tour, hadn't I? But it hadn't really sunk in. It just seemed like a little shed or something in the background. She actually lives in there, I thought. I was now looking at a different person. Whereas I'd seen this remarkable position with the world's greenest thumb, I now saw a pauper. Something deeply ingrained in me reacted violently to the situation. She has nowhere else to go. She continued to talk about the joys of homesteading, but all I could do was nod mutely and steal peeks at the horrifying sight of the 12 by 12. Would you like to come in for tea, she asked. Part of me did not. But she led me toward that terrible tiny house. To choose to live in anything so small was insane. As we approached the house, it seemed to shrink, and I imagined the awkward moment when we would both squeeze in and drink the tea standing up, painfully forcing conversation. Four winters had weathered its brown walls. As we stepped into a minuscule porch, she asked me if I'd mind taking off my shoes. Why did something paradoxical in me, at that moment, long for something grand? For something that shouted the glory of human beings, rather than being practically erased by the thick woods around it. Freud noted that people subconsciously struggle with two opposite but equal fears, being expelled by nature, cast out of Eden, and being absorbed by nature. This was the latter fear. By scaling down to only this tiny speck of human space, Jackie had been enveloped by nature. No electrical wires, no plumbing. The bubbling creek now sounded almost ominous. I pulled off my shoes, heard the door creak open. I couldn't see inside, didn't want to. I wanted to be back in the plush interior of the car, jazz on the stereo, cruising on the highway back to Chapel Hill. But there was no turning back. I stooped down and entered the box. So that was the first moment um, that I saw the 12 by 12. Of course, it was just a kind of an interview or a kind of a moment of meeting her. Um, but one thing led to the next, and I received a letter from her, a handwritten letter, a week later, when I was just about to head back to New York. And um, she invited me to tiny house sit for her, <laughs> to stay in the house for a season while she was out west. Um, and, and I took her up on it. I changed my flight, and I went out to the banks of No Name Creek. And just a little taste of what it's like out there, a real brief taste of this kind of paradise, in a way. Perhaps there's a cure in the practice of curiosity. With no electricity, piped water, or any of the conveniences we are so accustomed to, I was forced to see everything anew. The first puzzle, how in the world was I to bathe? Now, Jackie didn't leave an instruction manual, an idiot's guide to living 12 by 12. There was no shower, of course, and the creek was still too darn cold. But so was the rainwater Jackie harvested from the two gutters running off the 12 by 12's roof. I took one bucket shower, cursing as I cupped freezing rainwater over my head, before I discovered a five gallon rubber diaphragm on her back porch labeled sun shower. The directions were on the side of it, and I followed them, filling up the rubber bag and letting the morning sun heat it. Midday or evening, I strung it up in a tree beside the 12 by 12 and felt the positively hot water stream over my body, which became a sensuous daily pleasure. Fire replaced electric light. Sparks from outdoor fires would briefly escape gravity and reflect off the creek before disappearing into the massive dark sky and the flaming white points of the stars above. 
Most luxurious of all, each night was blessed with the glow of candles. On the 11th night, I lit the candles without even thinking about it. I simply came in after a hike, struck a match, lit them, and began cooking, candle lighting having become as automatic as switch flipping. The house glowed from the inside like a jack-o'-lantern. Sometimes I'd step outside and look in through the windows, a dozen or so, so candles inside. The 12 by 12 point lit with primordial fire amid dark woods, and I'd feel this smile spreading across not just my face, but my spirit as well, lifting me with a feeling of emotional weightlessness. So it may seem a bit like paradise or a bit, but there was a very dark side to the whole thing of being out there in the 12 by 12. This is not Walden. Um, in the 21st century, you can't exactly retreat from globalization. So the sonic boom of military jets flying over the 12 by 12, because North Carolina is a big base area for Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you know, the Virginia Tech massacre happened while I was out there just over the border. Um, so I was reflecting and dealing with that in this community. And there was a cheese scare. Cheese is a mix of Tylenol PM and um, heroin that hit the high schools and was just really taking over. Um, and then also there was the smell, the terrible odor that would waft over the 12 by 12 and over No Name Creek out there of the chicken factories. So here I am, I'm just going on one of my walks um, during the day and suddenly I came upon this walking from the 12 by 12. And then to my left, I saw the source of the stench, a monstrous chicken factory. Keep out, bio-sealed, read one sign in flaming red. Another sign, gold-kissed poultry center. Behind the signs was an absurdly manicured lawn, like an estate photo from town and country, and a dozen or so more houses, long rectangular warehouses for the poultry. By now, the smell was almost unbearable. On the warehouses, circular fans blew out feathers and the stench of chicken waste. These chicken houses were identical to the others I'd seen on the drive out to Dr. Benton's. They each did tens of thousands of birds a day, feeding the Goldkiss empire. Goldkiss was the country's third largest chicken processor until it was purchased in 2007 by the even larger Pilgrim's Pride. In addition to mutilating their chickens through beak searing, tail docking, and ear cutting, Goldkiss was experimenting with featherless chickens to eliminate inefficient plucking, along with beakless chickens that couldn't peck each other, something they tend to do as they go nuts over being confined to a dark space their whole lives. So what this is is not an isolated you know, occurrence of one chicken factory. It's part of a kind of a disease that I was seeing. You know, it's a kind of a a plague, you might say, or a disease. It's like almost as if the earth right now is a diseased organism. You know, with climate change, with massive deforestation, all of this, um, you know, and the antibody, luckily, is the people. You know, as I saw in Copenhagen when I was there in December for the climate conference, it's just the people, it's us that's gonna solve the climate crisis, not the leaders. You know, so there's two million NGOs, small women's groups, small environmental groups around the world, as Paul Hawken reports, that are all these antibodies that are working to, to save the planet. And um, I also had just returned from this decade abroad where although you know some of my projects in Bolivia and West Africa and around the world were successful locally, but the bigger picture was hammering away at it. And I realized that really what I have to do is look at my own society and think about how can we make a change here. You know, the glaciers that were melting above my apartment in La Paz, Bolivia was happening because of you know, SUVs being used here. You know, so there's this whole connection there. And um, the other thing is, I'd met the world's last Watasue woman in the Bolivian Amazon. It was in my project, one of my projects down there, and I actually shook her hand. It felt like my grandmother's hand with the um, veins. I could feel the veins. And I looked into her eyes and we, we spoke. And she died after that. And she was the last person who could speak Watasue. Now there's nobody left. And you know, it's something that we don't really want to hear about or see, but it's real. It's real. We're losing um, a tongue every fortnight, you know, one language every two weeks because of, you know, biofuel pr plantations and um, logging and grazing. The types of things that I've seen working around the world. Um, this economic model is causing not just extinction of species but also of people. And really, what it comes down to, I think, is the wrong metaphor. And that's why I try in this book to focus on the metaphor of the soft world, a living, textured 
world. We need to, we need to see that. Um, how many people have read or have heard of Thomas Friedman's Flat World, The World is Flat? OK, so like more than half. And if you go to Washington, DC, practically everyone um, has heard about it. It's, like, it's one of these metaphors that's very deep in our consciousness. So um, Friedman's metaphor articulates a truth about the way we've come to imagine the 21st century. The metaphor carries a host of negative connotations. The world has hit a flat note. Industrial agriculture creates a flat taste. And multinational corporations flatten our uniqueness into homo economicus, serving a one world uniplanet. A once natural atmosphere has been flattened by global warming. Every square foot of it now contains 390 parts per million of carbon dioxide instead of the 275 historically. Rainforests are flattened to make cattle pastures. A living ocean is depleted and flattened by overfishing. Vibrant cultures like that of Kusasu are steamrollered to the edge of extinction. Have the well-rounded objectives of our founding fathers, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, been flattened to a single organizing principle, the unification of greeds? Does the world have to be flat? Is it too late to imagine other shapes? So that's the kind of disturbing feelings of almost like depression I was having coming back to the States after all those years abroad and viewing my own society through this 12 by 12 lens and viewing these terrible metaphors. And, um, but there was hope to be found. And I think there's a lot of hope. And part of that hope was in some of the wild crafters that I discovered out there. Um, you know, people like the Thompsons, my neighbors at the 12 by 12. It was a family out there. And um, they were reinventing the Jeffersonian ideal of independent freeholding you know, and getting your own plot of land and farming it. His kids, six of them had been living in, they'd been living in a trailer park in the Triangle area in Raleigh or Durham. And unfortunately, they got involved with drugs and guns. And they said, you know what? We're going to go back to the land. We're going to become organic farmers, <laughs> which they did. And they were just experimenting, and they were still learning. Um, but it was so empowering to see them and dozens of others doing this. Let me just share a little bit of their story with you just for very briefly. And this is kind of a funny moment interacting with his kids. Um, Mike Thompson, the nine-year-old Kyle's dad, walked toward me through the gentle hill from his house, a bucket of feed swinging in each hand. He was a portrait in reds, rosy cheeks, a tomato red shirt in black block letters, support organic farmers, and a pirate's red goatee hanging a full six inches off his chin, hiding his Adam's apple. I could see in him a reflection of Kyle, a tilt of the head, a similarity in the ease of offering his smile. On other days, I'd notice a blend of introspection and unease on Mike's face. He'd be putting up a hog pen or feeding the chickens, and he'd have another look, as if doubtful his organic dreams would actually flourish. But on this day, he had a glow around him, as if he'd found his place on the earth. In a huge splash of dry grains, he dumped out both pails of feed, emitting a little whoop as he did. Winged creatures rushed at Mike and me, aiming for the seed piled at our feet. The farm around us was a chaotic swarm of birds. Out of this chaos, I felt a tug on my sleeve and looked down to see Kyle. I found a chicken for you, he said. I recalled a conversation we'd had while I bought eggs from him the previous day about getting some poultry as well. Yes, the chicken meat. Do you have some ready? No, but I have a chicken, he said, pointing into the swirl of chickens and ducks around us. There it is. That's yours, the white broiler. I saw it, but only for a second. A nice five-pound chicken strutting around in the free air, not squeezed into a chicken factory pen. It soon vanished into a swarm of color as other birds swooped in. How much is it? I asked, and immediately regretted the question. What did it matter? There was no doubt I would buy that chicken and many more chickens from this family, even if it were twice the price of a factory farm chicken. I looked around at all this genetic diversity, this happy dance of people and animals, and suddenly wanted to buy all of their chickens. I wanted to support this. So um, a couple of days passed there. One day, Kyle saw me from across the pond and ran over to remind me about the dangling issue of the white broiler. 
He pointed it out again in the swarm of fowl, and I told him I'd take that one plus another. Okay, Kyle said. Would you like to take them with you? Like this, I said, but they're alive. He looked up at me through blue eyes, a little puzzled. I tried to clarify, they need to be slaughtered. Yes, Kyle said innocently. You're going to slaughter them. A moving wall of chickens, turkeys, and ducks was all around us. Kyle was now joined by two of his brothers. The three blonde boys stared at me with an earnest, expectant intensity. I was fully acquainted with the relevant theory. If you eat it, you should be able to kill it. Someone else shouldn't do your dirty work. And if I couldn't kill a chicken, perhaps the only honest response was to become a vegetarian. Kyle filled the silence. My dad can show you. It takes one hour. How about we talk about it later? <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Um, so anyway, it's just a little slice of one of these um, families out there. And you know, you can picture the, the factory farm chicken, the, the, the smell versus this, just incredible contrasts. I'm just going to close with one paragraph um, that I think takes us full circle from you know, some of the mystery of who is this Dr. Benton into some of the horrors of the flat worlds all around it and into what each of us can kind of do in our own lives. And there's so much we can do. It's the great thing about the environmental issue is that any one of us can go home and make a change. When I was in Santa Fe last week, everyone in the audience, like 50 or 60 people, each wrote down one thing that they would do, you know, when they left. Like some people were super hyper environmentalists living off grid, but even they can do one more thing. And other people were sort of urban middle class folks that could take one step. And it's like amazing the amount of energy that came out of that. So, you know, I'd encourage each person in here today to take that one action, you know. Even in large cities, it's possible to maintain warrior presence and scale back from overdevelopment to enough. By planting a windowsill or community garden, doing yoga, walking and biking, and carrying out at least one positive action for others every day. Nor do we need to live 12 by 12 to experience the subtle joy of being. Whether in the city or the country, leave your cell phone behind and sit or walk for 15 minutes very slowly. Pay attention to your senses. Feel the breeze. Notice the smells and sounds. We decide what's get we decide what gets globalized, consumption or compassion, selfishness or solidarity, by how we cultivate the most valuable place of all, our inner acre. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I mean, because I've been working, as you know, for 10 years abroad in subsistence cultures. I've spent plenty of time off the grid in Liberia, Sierra Leone, South America. So it wasn't entirely new to me. Um, you know, and I'm drawing a lot of those experiences into the book as well. Um, the amount of time that was actually out there was just one season. It was the end of winter into spring. Um, I lived out there. And um, I've been back several times to talk with her and to interview her and, and so on. Yeah, I was, well, I did have my laptop, but the battery would die after like a few hours. And then I would charge it at the local library, sometimes driving on my bike down there. I had just a bike, no car. Um, so I was pretty much off grid for that time. Well, Dr. Benton chose those dimensions for quite a practical reason. Um, any structure 12 by 12 or below is considered to be a shed or a non-house. So you don't have to pay property taxes. That's good. Um, but also, you're not required by the state to put in plumbing and electricity and so forth. You don't need permits. In fact, if it's 12 by 13, you have to put in plumbing and you have to put in electricity. It's required by law. So it's a little bit radical, the whole thing. In fact, they're not even supposed to live there year round. And there are others who are 12 by 12 ing around her now that have imitated it. Um, so that's why I changed her name. And it's kind of anonymous. I mean, it's, it's anonymous. Um, but it's also the idea of, you know, she was a physician. She had lots of money. And she just decided to downsize. She realized that in her, she's in her 60s. She's like 60 years old, 61 years old. She figured, you know, now's the time to scale back to what I really need. My kids are grown up. This is the right size for me. So she's not encouraging you to go uh, live in a cave and eat roots and berries or build yourself a 12 by 12, you know, although some people are. Um, you know, the idea is to ask, like, sort of, what's my 12 by 12? What are the dimensions of enough in my life? That's kind of what she's getting at. You know, there were some days where I had almost none, I would say, where I just spent 
And I talk a lot about solitude in the book and the value of solitude and retreats, you know, to get in touch with those inner emotions that are um, blackberries and our, all of our gadgets and everything distract us from, you know. So there was plenty of that. But there was plenty of community, too. And I think people have a misconception of off-grid as being a hermit's. Uh, not at all. In fact, off the grid doesn't just mean off the electrical grid. It means off the sort of mainstream cultural grid and creating subcultures. So that whole area was rich with other wild crafters and permaculturists and bio fuel diesel, you know, biodiesel brewers and everything else um, that formed communities, went to each other's weddings, traded goat for lettuce and vegetables. Like there was this constant exchange and barter and kids playing with each other and so on. So I was involved with all of those different you know, people all the time. You know, whether the kids next door would come over and work with me on her plot of land, or I'd go over there, and you know, just this constant exchange. You know, I want to say that she had a solar-powered shortwave radio that picks up BBC and stuff like that. I think so, but I'm not 100% sure on that. You know, she's got her daughters live in Chapel Hill, so she goes in and visits them. She's got a grandchild now, so she'll listen to probably some news there. Um, but no, I think the idea is to be pretty much outside of that that whole thing. And music, you'd be amazed at how little you need music, even if you love it, when you have the sound of the creek flowing by and the, the different birds and the, the trees blowing overhead and everything. It's just like this whole other soundscape that human beings existed in you know, for 99% of our evolution as species. We were in that soundscape, not like the, the headphones. Did she have a car? She did. She had a car that runs on biodiesel, and it was locally brewed biodiesel like in that area. So yeah. But whenever she travels, she, she gray dogs it, she said. You know, she gray dogs it, like she just takes buses, even across the country, you know. <laughs> so that inspired me to take a bus up here today, actually. No, I didn't find them to be anti, I mean, there was definitely like libertarians on the right, libertarians on the left, there was all kinds of political points of view and like homeschoolers and everything. Um, but no, I didn't find there to be that, that wasn't a big part of it. It was more like the sustainability agenda, you know, cultivating more joy in one's life, um, growing one's own food, the healthiness of it, sharing with neighbors. You know, th those types of, I think, that was what was driving it much more than any kind of anti-government agenda. I didn't sense much of that at all, you know. Yeah, I mean, I honestly believe, just from my first-hand experience, 10 years in different countries around the world, or 15 years, like, that corporate globalization is committing ecocide against the planet. I don't think we can state that more strongly. Um, Especially today, I mean, the, the oil spill, you know, it's just, it's, it's terrible, but to me it's not terribly surprising. It's just like almost like a metaphor for everything else that's happening around the world. I mean, do you know that we're losing an acre, we're still losing an acre of rainforest every two minutes, you know? So thousands today were lost. Um, so the climate is heating up fractionally today and everything else. It's the environmental era, in a sense. So yeah, you know, like living 12 by 12, you saw it even that much more clearly. Yeah, I mean, I did feel like the neighbors in that area did have those community ties that gave them a sense of identity outside of the mainstream culture. The subcultures are growing stronger in this country. Those pockets are all over the place. You know, it's in the hundreds of thousands now, people who are living those types of lifestyles all around the country. Um, so there's lots of ways. One thing on my website, williampowersbooks.com, I've got a resources section that lists other wild crafters, permaculturists, all those different links um, to how to connect. Um, there's also a network of sustainable communities, um, intentional communities. I forget the exact address. I mean, they have a direct website, but you can link into that. It includes a lot of permaculturists. Another great thing is if you're traveling to, there's the World Organic Farms Network, the WOOF Network. So you can work on WOOF Farms, you know, around the world traveling and like it's free. You stay with them. You work four hours a day. It's a great experience. And I encourage young people like yourself, anyone to travel, get outside of our culture for a while, you know, experience it as an anthropolo anthropologist would from outside, you know. <laughs> she asked how I dealt with killing the chickens. Um, we have to read the book to find out. I, mean, I don't want to give everything away right here, you know. Um, but actually, well, I actually have to say I did not kill the chickens. Um, I couldn't go through with it, my own personal whatever. Yes, in fact, I did eat chicken from just from them while I was out there, and just eggs from them, and lamb from another neighbor, and, you know. A lot of what I ate was out of her garden, out of Dr. Benton's gardens, you know, the greens, shiitake mushrooms growing on logs, and she made, like, all her own sort of wines and jams and all that kind of stuff. But one thing I should just stress, though, is that it wasn't all about work. Um, 
What I've noticed living abroad for 10 or 15 years is that there's a leisure ethic around the world, which is in opposition to the work ethic. And there's a lot of joy to be had in these other ideas. And I think that like the revolution must be irresistible in a way. And anthropologists, you know, anthropologists say that like the average subsistence farmer works 21 to 22 hours a week. Um, you know, and I just found that fascinating how like in Africa all over the place, people who were living so simply seem so happy. Maybe people can relate to that. And I think it's because people are people through other people in these countries. It's about being more, not having more. And there's a whole sort of idle majority out there of people who are outside of the kind of like industrial revolution driven sort of factory work ethic. You know, and I discovered that also in these wild crafter communities in North Carolina was a lot of times sitting around the porch talking with neighbors, chatting, you know, it wasn't like it was this driven culture. Because in some ways, like the most uh, ecological thing you can do is to do less, you know. So, so getting online, all of that stuff, I mean, um, so you're asking like how people would be able to do that? Or people were connected. I don't think this is like a sort of neo Luddite movement like rejecting all technology. So some people like had their panels on the roof and they'd be connected to computers. Um, others were using the library. The library was very well used, you know. Um, people would bike or take their biodiesel down to the library and use the internet there, you know, but for like an hour a day or an hour a week or whatever it was. That's what Dr. Benton does, so. Among like, yeah, definitely. It, it seems that way, but it really isn't because it's simple, it's simplicity. like. And this may sound terrible, and I hate to talk about it at such a renowned institution like the Harvard Bookstore. But um, there was this composting toilet that she has that's a five-gallon bucket. That's it. It's the simplest. There's the Humanor Handbook. It's like the Bible of composting toilets that she had on her shelf. And you just put this bucket under a toilet seat hidden in, it looks like a regular toilet. And then it just fills up, and it gets composted. And in 13 weeks, it's regular soil like anything else. I couldn't personally composted with my t tomatoes and potato peels. It's just the aesthetics of it bothered me, despite the science being that it's just soil. Um, in terms of water, you wouldn't believe the amount of water you can harvest off a 12 by 12 roof um, in North Carolina. When I arrived, these two 150 gallon tanks on either side of her house were full, and when I left, they were full. So all of my cooking, washing, cleaning, everything came out of those, buck out of those tanks, you know, the sun showers. Um, there's also a spring, a hidden spring nearby that you can go to get very fresh water. Just fill your bottles and bring it back. Um, so I found that water, electricity, none of those things even bothered me at all. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's really possible to do it. So it's very tempting, very tempting. I mean, it's very, um, like I said, just um, closer to nature. I think a lot of the sort of mental illness and sort of um, emotional problems in our society are connected to that divorce between nature and ourselves. You know, so when you can bridge that gap even to a small amount, it just works miracles on your psyche and your well-being. Um, however, you know, each of us has to look at our own lives and figure out what's our own 12 by 12. Uh, at this stage in my life, I feel like I have a lot to give in other ways. And by just going off-grid um, completely right now, it might not be the moment for it. You know, so I use it as kind of a retreat space more than anything. The local community college in Chatham County there has permaculture classes, also how to do like wild tinctures and how to like harvest herbs out of the forest and all that, um, a whole curriculum headed up by this guy Harvey Harmon who's a professor there and he took the initiative and so he's teaching permaculture, sustainable arch architecture, all these things. So yeah, she's been taking those classes with him and gaining those skills, you know, also maybe reading the Foxfire manuals about how to like remember those skills and bring them back and you know, inspiring herself. So it took several years before she actually like built this house. And by the way, it only cost $17,000 for the cabin and two acres of land on a creek. Not a bad deal. You can pay that off right away. And uh, it's, you know. Well, yeah, it's North Carolina. So there were lots of vegetables already out, like strawberries and greens and, you know, all kinds of things that are starting to come out. Um, different herbs, but you know, it's not until like sort of June, July that you get the full blast of, of food. You know, uh, I know some people are doing that. They're eating within 100 miles of their house and local vores. Um, you could, but it takes a lot of, a lot of planning and a lot of, you know, eating just roots and tubers most of the winter and, you know, but, and you know, like a lot of the folks out there, they, they can and jar things and they're very into that whole culture of preserving. 
Is anybody here six foot tall? Any, anyone about six foot tall? Okay, could you stand up for a second? Okay, so it's two of him <laughs> by two of him. That's 12 by 12. So it's like up to that roof there, up to the end of the red, and then over the same amount and back. It's a pretty small area, isn't it? Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, you know, that, that, that's a small space. But on my website, we've got schematics that an artist friend of mine drew up so you can see exactly what it looks like inside and outside with the zones, the permaculture. But, um, you know, basically there's a loft up above with the bed. So that's where I slept and a little window up there. And then down below is the stove and the, her great grandmother's rocking chair and some bookshelves and all that. And then two porches. The porches don't count against the 12 by 12 size. So those are also outdoor spaces. Like one of the, the composting toilet was out back, and that's where you'd wash dishes. And the front was like a little swing, you know. And then there's the zone principle of permaculture where you put the kitchen garden right near your kitchen. Um, you have that deer fenced in. Beyond that is the stuff that's like berries and fruit trees that can survive contact with deer. And then it's like wood and other non-timber forest products. And then just pure aesthetic pleasure of nature beyond that. And this was to resist sprawl. This was part of a 30-acre plot with five families on it, each that had two acres. And 20 acres was just set aside for conservation. And that was this very innovative um, eco designer that I talk about in the book who is teaching these courses and who's setting up these communities. He thought that was the only way to stop sprawls by buying up the land and creating these communities. He's done lots of them. So they were. And um, you know, there's social security and there's like, you don't need much money if you're living in a 12 by 12, or you're living very simply. Um, and Medicare and, you know, but yeah, there was a lot of like sort of natural, um, you know, plants. And, um, but one thing I would say that's kind of controversial, I don't mean to offend anyone, but one thing that I've noticed in living abroad for all these years is that people have a different relationship with death in other countries, especially in soft world societies, indigenous cultures, where they're not as afraid of it. And there's kind of like more of an emphasis on like extended families and communities and less fear of death. So at a certain point, you pass away. But you have all these offspring and everyone else that's replacing you. So you know, I think that our culture has gone a little bit too far in that direction, perhaps, and that it's OK to have a certain level of health care that's not necessarily the absolute you know, best. Well, um, some of the other 12 by 12ers, they have it uh, laid out differently where they don't have the bed up, up top. And like these other, these other family I talk about, they're, they're the Paul and Paul. It's a father-son combo with like. Paul's wife now, and they're having a baby in the 12 by 12 in July. <laughs> so I'm going down to North Carolina next week, and I'll be seeing that. But um, they, they've built four 12 by 12s. So they can live in different ones. So, yeah. It's in Chatham County, and it's just sort of west of Chapel Hill. So it's about an hour from that urban area of one million people. So a lot of these folks can actually survive as organic farmers because they have this big market. There's tons of farmers markets in those cities that they can sell their stuff. And definitely farmers markets are awesome, as everyone knows. But um, by supporting that, you're supporting these types of people. And that more Jeffersonian ideal of, of being able to be a, a landholder in this country. And I think that's really the bedrock of democracy in some ways, is having that independence you know, and freedom. So. OK, thanks. Thanks a lot.